chapter 24. Um, if you're paying attention, you know that we're almost through this summer series, but only about halfway through Genesis. Uh, I will tell you not to worry, though. That's kind of how Genesis works. So um, two of the four main characters in Genesis after Genesis 11 uh, basically just take up the first half of Genesis and then all the other characters there as well and the two following take up the last entire half. So uh, we're going to look at uh, Jacob and, and Joseph and God's movement in and through their lives in the next couple of weeks, but we're going to start this morning in chapter 24. Before we get there, though, I just want to acknowledge that if you've read Genesis before, or even if you've just been reading along as we have been going or have simply listened here on a Sunday morning, you come to the quick conclusion that there uh, is a large amount of messed up families in Genesis. It's shocking the amount of messed up relationships and families that you find there. I want to run down just a little list of what we find in Genesis. Cain, right out of the gate early in Genesis, is jealous of his brother Abel, and he kills him. Lamech introduces polygamy to the world. Thank you for that one. Noah, the most righteous man of his generation, gets drunk and curses his grandson. Not his son, which some of you could empathize with, but his grandson. Lot, when his home is surrounded by residents of Sodom who want to violate his visitors, offers instead his daughters to them. Later on, Lot's daughters get him drunk and get impregnated by him, and we're told that Lot was the most righteous man in Sodom. Abraham passes Sarah, his wife, off as his sister, protect his own life. God bails him out, but he does it again, twice, and plays favorites between his sons Isaac and Ishmael, and they become bitter enemies. Jacob plays favorites between Joseph and his other sons, and they want to kill Joseph, but fearing the consequences, they simply end up selling him into slavery to a caravan of foreigners that's passing through at that time. And the marriages in Genesis are filled with disaster as well. Abraham has sex with his wife's servant at his wife's request, and then sends her and their son off to die in the desert. Isaac and Rebekah fight over which of their boys is going to get the blessing and the inheritance. Jacob marries two women and ends up in a fertility contest with both wives and their female servants. Jacob's firstborn son, Reuben, sleeps with his father's concubine, a woman that's just um, in the family for physical pleasure of the father and the patriarch. Another one of Jacob's sons, Judah, sleeps with his daughter-in-law. She's dressed like a prostitute, and he doesn't know who she is. That's just a little of what we find in Genesis. Do any of you feel better about your own families now? <laughs> right? Any of you feel a little bit better, maybe, about your own marriages? It's very clear that this, this is not a story of a bunch of pious people who don't reflect real life. In fact, if you're reading it carefully, you've got to wonder why all this is included. You're not going to find these kinds of stories in other texts of world religions. And I will say this morning, the author of Genesis is not morally confused. He's not unsure. Genesis kicks off the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible that are really, uh, in a sense, kind of a self-contained volume. And they include, among other things, the Ten Commandments. And these first five books of the Bible have been called the most morally influential writings in human history. The most morally influential writings in human history history. They lay the groundwork for all of the individual rights and human rights that we take for granted and sometimes think we came up with today. Genesis records the stories of real people. They're quite complex. They're full of all their sin and ambiguity as we are. And they're included in Genesis as they lived 
and as they were because the writer of Genesis does not intend them to be held up as the heroes of the story. They're included as they are and as they were in real life to point us to the real hero of the story, God himself. He's the one moving. He's the one keeping things headed in the right direction. God is working with real flesh and blood people living in a terribly fallen world, and so it is with us this morning. I mean, how many of you would say that in some way, just within the the last few weeks, you've been disappointed in yourself? Not other people, just yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible is real stuff, real stories of God moving in a redemptive way in the lives of real people. He's the God of the story of human history, and he's the God of your story. And to the degree that you and I try so hard to write our own story and to direct our own story, we're going to live with frustration, and we're going to be going against the flow of God's divine purpose in our lives. He's the God of the story when things are big in our lives, when everything is up and to the right high, and some of you may be experiencing that right now, where just wave after wave of goodness and delight is coming into your life. He's the God of the story when things are low and to the left. But he's also the God of the story when things are just kind of quiet and uncertain. A lot of the seasons of our lives are like this, are they not? They're just fairly quiet, regular seasons, somewhat uncertain seasons, maybe about if God's working in us and through us, how God may be working in us and through us. Well, we're going to look this morning at the quietest and most uncertain of the four major male figures from Genesis 12 through the end of Genesis of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Isaac, in a sense, is kind of the shy patriarch. There's less written about Isaac than there is any of the other three. But what's written there is significant. And what's written there reminds us that it is God who's at work. And some of you need reassurance this morning because your life isn't one of those kind of quiet, mundane, possibly uh, seemingly purposeless or, or pointless seasons. And you're a bit uncertain as to what God's doing or if he's doing anything or if he's going to do anything. And so I want us to look at a number of things that are always true about the God of the story who redeems people and transforms people and gifts his people and guides his people through life, including the quiet and uncertain times. The first is simply what I just said. The God of the story guides. He guides He guides through the quiet and uncertain times in ways that you can't foresee and you may not be aware of if you're not walking deeply in tune with him. Let's pick up Abraham and Isaac and Rebecca's story in 24 verse 1. Abraham was now very old and the Lord had blessed him in every way. I love verse 1 of chapter 24. Abraham now was very old. Not old, but very old. And you guys can define, some of you, where you are on that, on that scale this morning. Old, very old. If you have grandchildren or young children around you, they will tell you always that you are very old. I may have shared this last week, but one of our twins told me that last week. Daddy, you're so old. Your skin looks very old. I hope one day I don't get old like you. All right? So the Bible just starts out and says, hey, Abraham was very old. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. What a significant statement. The Lord had blessed him in every way. We just heard a little bit about Abraham. Was Abraham a perfect man? No. He blew it, and he blew it in some very big ways. But God was with him, and it blessed him. Verse 2, he said to the senior servant in his household, 
the one in charge of all that he had. This is likely Eliezer, if you look back at Genesis 15. But since, for I'm sure providential reasons, the writer of Genesis chooses to simply refer to him as the servant or the senior servant rather than Eliezer, that's how we're going to look at him this morning and refer to him. So Abraham calls in his senior servant, the one that's most trusted, the highest esteemed, the one that's in charge of everything. And he says this, put your hand under my thigh. Now let's pause for a minute. There are many reasons why I'm grateful to be a modern Westerner. But among them is the avoidance of cultural norms like this, as well as holy kisses. This was actually a common practice, and certainly a common practice among patriarchal, influential, powerful men. What's happening here is, is Abram is, or Abraham, I, I got so used to saying Abram, now it's hard for me to shift. Abraham is asking his senior servant to place his hand under his thigh near his reproductive organ as a way of swearing confidence and trust in, in the covenant promises of God that through Abraham's line would come the promised people and promised Messiah of God. If I was a servant, this would have been the jumping off place for bargaining. Could I put my hand on your shoulder? Could we shake? All right? Could I touch your foot? Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. Sometimes you and I forget this. That God is the God of heaven and he's the God of earth. He's the ruler of and the one who reigns over all the domains of life. This is his world. The nations are his. The trees are his. The mountains are his. The oceans are his. Governments are his. Rulers are his. All domains of life. All resources. He is the God of heaven and of earth. Swear to him that you will not get a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Remember, Abraham had left his family in Haran, and he had traveled as God had commanded and guided to the land of Canaan. But he doesn't want a wife from among the Canaanites for a son. Now, this is not a racial or ethnic thing. This is a religious thing. This is not an idolatry thing. And what he's saying is, I don't want my son to be, in a sense, we'd say, after having read Paul, unequally yoked. We don't want our son entering into a union with a woman who's going to tempt him to be worshiping false gods. I want you to go back to my people, my people who know me, my people who are aware of the covenant God I serve, and maybe they had come to serve this same God, it seems so at this point, and get a wife from there. Verse 5, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Not an unreasonable question, right? I mean, how many of you ladies, when you were single before you were married, would have enjoyed some man showing up? with some other men and saying, hey, you've been picked out. Got somebody for you to marry in a distant land. Let's go. And by the way, it's a distant relative. That wouldn't go over, obviously, in our culture, but it, it would be weird and unsettling at any point. Abraham answers and says, make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. It's an interesting phrase. Maybe he's worried that if Isaac goes back there, the covenant movement of God, the promises of God, the obedience that Abraham and Sarah had come to walk in by God's goodness would be reversed, would be stifled. I don't know, but some of you, some of you need to hear a word from God this morning about turning back. When, when by God's grace we come to faith in Christ, there is no turning back. There's no going back. There's only going forward with Christ into a life of sacrifice 
and generosity and faithfulness and trust. Verse 7, Abraham says, The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son there. Do you, do you hear Abraham's confidence in God's guidance? Now, this, is, this is not a wild time in, in Abraham's life. Sarah, his wife, has died. Isaac, his son, is around 40 years old. He's stable. He's wealthy. He's influential. He's very old. He's faithful before his creator and his redeemer. This is not a wild time. Yet in this time, in a very normal request at that time, hey, we've got to find a wife for my son. Abraham trusts that God is active in this process and guiding him. He trusts God's guidance even before it was a reality. Likely because of what he'd experienced with God so far. I wonder this morning, can you do that? Are you willing to stand on what you know of God from his word and from what he's shown you about himself across your years with him this morning and say, I believe you're guiding me now and you will guide me through decisions that are coming, through needs that are rolling my way. I trust you, God. I will praise your name. I will declare my trust in you and I will get up each morning with chosen confidence in you you are the God of the story you're the God of my story you're the God who guides in quiet and uncertain times can you do that will you do that we find out as we continue in Genesis 24 that he's also the God who listens he listens and he listens in the quiet and uncertain times as well. This is a hard one for us, and we'll talk more about it in a minute. But move down to verse 12. Verse 12. This is the servant now who'd gone on the way as Abraham had sent him, and he went with some camels loaded with all kinds of things. A little bit of an entourage with him. And in verse 12... He prays, Lord, God of my master, Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master, Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. You hear how conversational Abraham's servant is with God? He just prays. He prays very casually and very openly and very specifically and very honestly with a complete expectation that God's actually listening to him. That God's actually listening to him. He says, here's the deal, Lord. I'm at this spring. I'm standing here, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water, which was common early in the morning and sometimes late in the evening. Early in the morning is customary. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink. And I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you've chosen for your servant, Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now, who in here who's walked with God for any amount of time hasn't prayed something like this at some point? God, would you move in this way that I might know this is you and follow in obedience and faithfulness? I certainly have. And sometimes God has answered that very specifically, and sometimes he hasn't. But this is a model for how we pray, and it is a challenge to us to be trusting that God listens to us. Not just in, in big times, not just in high times or low times, but in the normal times. As we're going about normal business, this in a sense is just another day for the chief servant of Abraham's household. He's about his master's business. 
And he's trusting that God is listening, and God was listening. And look at verse 15. Before he had finished praying, now I'll say, this has not usually been my experience. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. God was listening. And he knows what we need. Let me do this just one, one more time, show of hands on this one. How many of you who are followers of Christ have ever been through a season where you're praying and you're doing all that you know to be faithful and it feels and seems from every human perspective like God simply really is not listening. He's just, he's not listening. Look around. This is a common experience for us. This is a common experience, and this is why God gives us his word so that we may not trust fully in our feelings. Feelings and emotions are a gift from God. They're beautiful, and they're part of how we experience the fullness of life, but you can't trust them. You've got to filter them through God's word, and we find again and again and again in God's word that he, in fact, is listening. He is listening. C.S. Lewis, in his classic work, Mere Christianity, that began as a series of lectures on the BBC um, during World War II, said this. He said, he, that is God, has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. He does not have to deal with us in the mass. You are as much alone with him as if you were the only being he had ever created. He has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. What a beautiful reality. One more Lewis quote here that I think is important whenever we're discussing an issue of prayer like we're seeing here. By the way, this is only the second prayer recorded in Scripture. The first is when, Adam, uh, when Abraham is uh, interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. But in his uh, letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer... Lewis wrote this, we must lay before him, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. What a great statement about the honesty of coming before God. He knows us anyway. He loves us through Christ. It's not your human righteousness. It's not your good works. It's not your moral beauty that gives you standing to approach God. It's Jesus Christ. It's the life and the sacrificial death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus that makes possible your full entry into the presence of God. Lay before him what is in you, not what ought to be in you. I love this. I think this is a very honest prayer from the servant. He says, God, the God of my master Abraham, here's where I am. Here's what I need. Here's what's going on. And if you would do it this way, I'll know that it's you. God is listening. God doesn't only guide, though. He doesn't only listen. He does indeed provide. And some of you need to hear this this morning, and you need to be reminded of this. Because, boy, are, are we not in a sort of a prolonged season of just a, a cultivated fear in our culture. It's like every day all kinds of interest groups are telling us what we should be afraid of, why we should be afraid, and how quickly doom is coming. And sometimes we can forget it's God who provides. I forget that. I forget that as a human being. I forget it as a child of God. I forget it as a husband, as a father. I forget it as a pastor. That God is the one who provides. Let's pick up this story in verse 17. The servant hurried to meet her. Hurries to meet Rebecca. Please give me a jar of water. Or please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, 
she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. What a remarkable servant's heart from this young woman. This is not a simple task, right? Camel people tell us that a thirsty camel can drink up to 30 gallons of water. There were 10 camels here. So Rebecca was fit, right? Not only could she send down the wooden bucket and get him some water and carry her jar around, she's like, it's no thing for me. I'll water the 10 camels too. And then after that, let's do a push-up contest. All right, I'm beautiful, and I'm fit. 300 gallons of water, potentially, is what she's offering to draw up bucket at a time, bucket at a time. They often had sort of built-in, carved-out stone um, troughs around spring wells and spring waters like that where they could water and care for their animals. God provides he provides what we need, and he provides beyond what we need. I was talking with uh, Jake yesterday to no resolution, but just out of interest at why it seems important in Scripture to describe. It, it, you understand why Sarah or Sarai is described as beautiful, Abraham's wife. It fits in the context there because he's afraid because of his wife's beauty, entering a foreign land with foreign people, that she's going to end up costing him his life. Um from other more powerful men who want to take her. But it's interesting because Rebecca is described as being beautiful. Rachel is described as being beautiful. God provides a wife and a beautiful one. Like He doesn't give him a troll. Jake told me not to address any of this this morning. She's confident. It's a confident young woman who meets a stranger in this day at a well and, and talks with him with humility but confidence. Yes, my Lord, I'll give you a drink. Drink up. In fact, I'll, I'll give all your camels the water they need. I was astounded thinking about this, thinking about her strength. Yesterday, yesterday, just cleaning up around our house, we trimmed some hedges and put out 19 bags of mulch. I had to take four ibuprofen and sleep all afternoon. And she's going to water all of his camels. It's very clear to Abraham's servant that God is at work. And as you look at Rebecca's responses, if you read all of Genesis 24, you find out also that she's faithful. She's trusting when it's time to go, her family says, you know what, let's, let's leave it up to Rebecca whether or not she wants to go now. And she says, let's go. I'll go back. God provides. We need to remember this when God isn't answering and moving on our time frame, which would most of us agree is fairly often. I mean, how many times have you been praying and God answers what you're praying while you're still praying? Part of that is because sometimes out of fear, we pray in generalities out of a fear of being let down. But I think when you look at Scripture, I don't think, I know. When you look at Scripture as a whole, the people of God are known for praying very specifically. And that honors God. It demonstrates real trust in Him. A real understanding of who He is and who He is to you as His people. To you as His child. And it's very hard to give credit where credit is due, and I mean toward the Lord, when he answers prayers, if we're too afraid to pray specifically for what we need and what we want. And continue to do that, waiting for God to answer specifically. But mostly, this isn't our story, right? God does provide, but often he doesn't provide exactly what we're requesting right when we request it like he did at this time and this unique time in redemptive history. Tim Keller in his book on prayer writes this, our time frames are not in touch with ultimate reality. How many of you could just say amen to that? I know Sharon could on behalf of me. My time frame is never in touch, not only with ultimate reality, often with reality at all. 
Our perspective on timing compared with God's is analogous to a two-year-old's with an adult's. God has good reasons for making us wait a long time to see some prayers answered. Can you trust that this morning? Are you willing to trust that? That knowing who God is, you have to say, if you're walking with Him and praying in line with His character and His purposes, and you're not getting an answer right now, that God must have good reasons for making you wait a long time to see some of your prayers answered. Some of you, that's exactly where you are this morning. That's exactly where you are this morning. I want want to remind you of the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. He's talking to his disciples about how they're to pray. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers... Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? These are rhetorical questions Jesus is challenging parents with. But the implied answer is is none of us. None of us would do this. Verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, isn't that a... uh, Isn't that an interesting statement about Jesus, even to his disciples early on? And isn't it uh, completely contrary to what we're told all the time in our culture? Everybody's really basically good. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to those who ask? Now, in this context, clearly Jesus is talking about the enabling, indwelling Spirit of God being given to his disciples. But in the wider body of Jesus' teaching, he says this over and over and over again. Ask your Father in heaven. He already knows what you need. Ask him for it. He's listening And he answers, and he'll provide. Which means, when when it isn't working like that, can can I just ask you to trust this, that the issue is with us and not God's Word? That when I read something in God's Word, and when I read it over and over and over again, and it's not my experience, that the issue is with my experience, not with the Word of God. That's where the fault lies. One last thing I'll point out this morning, by way of God's work, in the quiet and uncertain times of our lives is that wherever and however, well, you know what? Hold on. Before I give you this one, let's, let's look a little bit further. Let's go in a little bit further. Reading. She offers to, to give his camels a drink, and in verse 20, she quickly empties her jar into the trough, runs back to the well, draws more water, and draws enough for all of his camels. This would have taken several hours. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Isn't that interesting? It's almost like a moment of doubt mixed with belief. First of all, what kind of woman's randomly going to come out and say, sure, I'll give you a drink and I'll I'll draw for all your camels too? He should have known right then. But isn't it like us though when God does answer to go, maybe that's the Lord? But maybe not. I mean, have you not ever done that? Sometimes God answers so plainly, and you're like, man, thank you, God. Or maybe it was an accident. He's going, I don't know, here's this beautiful woman, and she's giving me a drink, she's watering all my camels, but this may not be the one. Verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring, weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. I like this. You know what? I like you. 
Thanks for the water. Here's a nose ring. Let's go back to your family's house. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder, as well as room for you to spend the night. Do you hear the, the generosity and the graciousness in Rebecca's responses? Then the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord. Prayer and worship are two sides of a coin of Christian existence. Prayer, rightly done, always leads to worship. Whether or not or whenever God is answering, prayer aligns us with God and stirs the affections of our hearts for him. Praise be, in verse 26, to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. The Lord has done exactly what Abraham anticipated the Lord would do. He's guided his servant through this journey. Before I give you the last point, the last characteristic here, I want you to look at verse 40. I want you to look at verse 40. Basically here, by this time, um, Abraham's servant is back at Rebekah's family home, and he's telling Rebekah's dad, Rebekah's brother, uh, their uh, extended family and servants there, the story of what happened, what Abraham charged him with, how it's gone, his prayer to God, what God has done. But look at verse 40. He replied, the Lord before whom I have walked with faithfully will send his angel with you. He's retelling Abraham's words. But listen again to Abraham. The Lord before whom I have walked faithfully will send his angel to you. Some of you need to hear this this morning. That's an apt description of Abraham. And yet we know Abraham's life, right? Faithfully walking with the Lord is not the same as perfectly walking with the Lord. None of us will do that. But from Abraham's call to his death, God was his God. Through the ups and the downs, through the failures, through his flaws, through his times of significant sin, he, he never gave himself to another God. Some of you beat yourself up badly. It's your personality and your temperament to do so when you fail. Just know that you can be described in God's perfect word as walking faithfully with the Lord even though you've blown it big at times. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Which leads me to the last point, that God still accomplishes his purposes in the quiet and uncertain times. You may not see him working. You may not discern his working. But in every minute of every hour of every day of our existence, globally and of your individual existence as a human being, God is at work accomplishing his purposes purposes look down at verse 62 verse 62 rebecca's joined the the camel caravan she's headed back to meet her husband to be verse 62 says now isaac had come from bear lahai roy for he was living in the negev he went out to the field one evening to meditate and as he looked up he saw camels approaching Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent with his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted. After his mother's death, Isaac was comforted, 
comforted after his mother's death. The tent of his mother, not with his mother. That's weird. Brought Rebecca into the tent of his mother. Sarah had already passed. God continues to move the story forward, accomplishing his purposes here. Rebecca and Isaac are united in marriage and union. And we won't look at it today, but if you look at, at verse 21 of chapter 25, you find that Rebecca struggles with what Sarah did. She's childless. And again, you wonder, where's this covenant promise of God going? But the text tells us that Isaac prays on behalf of Rebecca. The wording there is really unique. On behalf of Rebecca, because she's childless, and the Lord answers. And the Lord gives her twins. How many of you husbands pray often on behalf of your wife? On behalf of your wife. The wording here is beautiful. It's sacrificial. It points toward there being a a hurt, a wound, an unanswered yearning in Rebecca's life. And Isaac is giving himself sacrificially in prayer. Not just that he might have a son, but he's praying on behalf of his wife. And we know and we sang about it this morning that all God's promises, all God's promises are what? Yes and amen in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isaac prays and God moves. And again, the story continues to move forward. I want to end this morning though with a a word of caution. Because Isaac and Rebecca's story is a beautiful one, but it also contains a word of caution. It contains a challenge to us not to lose focus over the years, not to drift. Their marriage began, as we saw, as a God-ordained union. Love at first sight, at least it looks like for Isaac. A partnership of complementary personalities. Isaac was more subdued. He was a calmer personality. He was quieter. Rebecca was more vocal, more confident. A great match before God. But across the years, they they lost their focus, if you know the story. They lost their focus on the Lord. On God as their Lord and provider. I just want to remind you, again, it's not as important how you start it is important that's why we look back and we tell people our story and what was involved in God bringing us to faith in Christ it's important how you start but it's far more important how you finish your relationship with God it's far more important who you're becoming across the years and the decades is your life becoming more and more a reflection of the fruit of the spirit of love joy peace patience kindness faithfulness goodness self-control the Rebecca and Isaac erred tremendously as parents they divided their home by dividing their affection and their favor between their sons undermining their spirit toward each other And they failed to bring their sons up in the way of the Lord. The way that Abraham had, flawed as he was, brought Isaac up. And what what began with bright hope ends as a sad, cautionary tale. And yet, God is faithful. And through their marriage, and through one of their sons, would come the Messiah of the world. Would come Jesus Christ who stands this morning, risen and exalted, saying to you, run the race that I've marked out for you. Trust in me. Rest in me. Exercise grace-driven devotion and discipline, and I will be with you always. I will be with you always. Let's pray.
God, thank you so much that you are near to us and you are present, God, not just in times of great despair and pain and hurting, God, not just in times of great victory and great provision, God, but in the normal times, the normal seasons of life, the times when much in our life seems fairly quiet, mundane, maybe even uncertain. God, thank you that you guide us, even when we're unaware, Lord, that our confidence is in you. Our confidence is in your faithfulness. Thank you for listening to us, God. Even now in this place, right now, Father, your heart is open. Your ears are open. You're listening to me, to the prayers of your people. God, thank you for your provision. That is always what we need and even more. God, and thank you that regardless of our failures and our sin, regardless of how it looks in our life or in the lives around us, God, or in the world around us, you are at work accomplishing your good and beautiful purposes in this world. God, and that for some reason you've chosen to do that through us. Father, thank you for that. Now, God, as we move into a time of response, Father, as we prepare to receive offering, God, to to drop in connection cards, Father, with prayers going up to you, with commitments or questions about next steps that we sense you calling us to make, I pray, God, that you would bless those who are about to give. God, bless those who've given throughout the week. Father, may they know what a, what a sacred act of worship, what a declaration of trust and tangible form of obedience giving back to you is. God, remind us always that you take what we give and you do more with it than we can imagine. And on the other end of our generosity, Father, and our trust in you are changed lives by the power of your gospel. You got to place all this before you and more in Jesus' name.